Welcome. Thanks for coming, braving an urban blizzard and everything we've experienced for the last couple of days. And thanks for coming. This is Downtown Live. This is an event that we try to do about four times a year, just around, roughly quarterly. Um, something to kind of help downtown residents, those of us who are new and old downtown residents, feel a little bit more like a neighborhood. This is a you know, spectacular location, and we so thank the History Theater for being our host um, for these events. Um, our friends at SPNN also sponsored this event. Um, kindly ask that you silence your cell phones. So we all need to get sort of in that discipline again. Um, this is, uh, uh, even though it doesn't feel like spring is right here, spring is right around the corner. And uh, there are, of course, issues that come up with spring, especially when you're living downtown. Uh, one of them has to do with uh, the parks and I don't, I don't, sort of crime is a little overstated, but public safety in the parks. We all know that there's stuff goes on in the parks that you wonder what the police attitudes are. So this first half of tonight is a chance to talk, um, listen to the police and talk with them, ask your questions of them about all sorts of public safety issues around downtown. So the Skyway stuff, the park stuff, just stuff goes on in the streets. Um, they do these presentations now. Um, much more frequently than I think they used to. I compare this to a couple of years ago when the police presence was much uh, more modest than it is now and it's terrific to see them around and uh, we all really welcome that. Um, at the end of their presentation, I will be down here and if you want to come forward, if you've got questions, we'll take those questions. And then we'll move on to a couple of other elements. The other big element tonight is to talk about volunteer opportunities. Some new ones, some old ones that are available for those of us who live downtown. And I know there's a lot of um, interesting questions about that. When you do come up and ask a question, please, 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 please try to keep it brief. 30 seconds of a real comment or a real question um, would be really appreciated. And with that, I introduce my old colleague. I worked for many years at TPT, and Eric Eskel and I worked together for 33 some odd years. And so when we did this downtown live thing, we turned to Eric because he's sort of, a, uh, sort of perfectly comfortable doing this and uh, curious about everything around the Twin Cities. And so with that, I give you Eric Eskel. Thanks. Thanks for all for coming. <laughs> Bill hired me twice, so this is exciting. Um, Welcome to the theater and to our theater of seasons, although it's been kind of a one-act play, hasn't it? Snow and cold followed by slush and mud. So, All right, we have a, a great panel here. It's fantastic these fellas uh, showed up tonight. Wes Denning is the brand new downtown commander, St. Paul Police, Sergeant Mike Whistler. One of the downtown patrolmen is uh, Sergeant Tony Nicola, and then Lieutenant Rick Grapes from the Metro Transit. So they're here to uh, talk to me, and then I hope you'll have some questions as well. Uh, commander, you're brand new downtown. Uh, pull up the mic there and give us a little sense of your philosophy and, and uh, any changes from what the folks have seen downtown as far as a police present presence or a focus or emphasis. What, what do you want the downtown residents to know when, now that you're new in command? Well, I've been here for about a week in the downtown beat. <laughs> so, so give me a little room here. Um, the previous commander was uh, Brad Hazlett and he did a wonderful job the past six months or so that he's been down there. Um, he's established a lot of good relationships with not only community groups, but business leaders, um, a lot of the shelters, anyone who's in and around downtown area. So we're going to keep up everything that Brad had built and um, try and keep building upon that. Brad's going to be involved for a little bit while I'm kind of um, getting going here. but. Uh, we really do have a, a good group of police officers and sergeants assigned to the downtown area. Um, and what we want to do is basically ensure public safety um, for all the residents downtown, the business owners, people who visit um, downtown, whether it's the sporting events or the concerts. Um, and like you had said, our, our, over the past several years, our, our presence has uh, been on the uptick. Several years ago, we had I think 14 police officers assigned to the downtown beat. Now we're up to 24 or so police officers, three sergeants and a commander specifically for the downtown beat area. So it's kind of a um, ever growing unit within the police department. Sergeant Whistler, what do you want to say about how folks could best help the police downtown? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, okay. 
I That's good. am a big proponent of the Skyway pager system. And whether you are a resident or an employee, employer, or guest to the downtown area, we've got this really slick paging system and it is a direct connection to the patrol personnel in the downtown beat. Simply pick up the phone, 651-229-1994 will put you into a series of voice prompt beeps and you leave a quick little recording. And one of the good examples is Peg Gilfoyle. Peg, where are you seated? Peg can attest firsthand to what a wonderful tool the pager system is for folks that are in the downtown area. Peg left a little message for us. Hey, Peg, calling here. I'm in the uh, walkway to the library and there's a gentleman here who appears to need some assistance. Could you please send someone or start someone this way? It bypasses the downtown emergency communications center whereby you're directed to a call taker who asks a litany of questions and then your call is entered into a queue that sometimes is very long. Skip all that, call us directly, leave your name and a callback number and your location and we'll respond within seconds of hearing your request for the police. 651-229-1994. Nine, four. And really what I like to tell people is test it before you need it. So whether it's on your way home tonight or uh, tomorrow morning, give it a call and just say, hey, this is so-and-so trying a test page, might mention this number, uh, but put the number into your cell phones, call us, and we'll come running, literally. This is kind of the see something, say something. Yes. Very much so, absolutely. I'd like to ask the Lieutenant Grapes and Sergeant Nickel a little bit to, to tag team on this. Uh, Central Station seems to be a, a focus uh, of some of the activity and some of the uncomfortableness of, that, that some residents downtown have. Uh, Sergeant Nicola, is, is the perception worse than the reality? Is it, a, you know, is it I'm uncomfortable rather than I'm in danger? And then, uh, Lieutenant, a little bit about uh, is, that a, is that a stress point or a focus point for the, the transit police? Sergeant? It, it's going to be perception on, on how people feel, but we, we definitely try to get out there. I'm, I'm in charge of the afternoon shift. And just to break it down um, for you folks to understand, Minneapolis, for example, has five precincts. Uh, St. Paul has three districts, east, central, west. The downtown beat is within the central district. And this is, it's a, a kind of a specialized unit. It's, it's, you have to apply to get in. And just because it's different, it's a different kind of animal, um, you're, it's a lot more um, PR out there and, and a lot more customer service. Not that the other officers can't do it, but it's a, it's a little slower pace, but it's a lot more um, meet and greet and, and talking to people. So that is, is definitely a challenge with, with that area. And part of the problem is, uh, one officer said it great. Like a lot of times, we're just moving. We're moving water in a pool, because you get people that that hang out in one spot. And we we is we're police officers. We have a lot of power, but we're also limited, and we can only do so many things. So a lot of times, we just move people along. Um, getting new businesses down there and, and more people down there that really helps, and more of a police presence. Transit has done a fantastic job. Uh, staffing officers there and, and it's really turned around and, and the, th the degree of honor building nearby is being uh, built up with some apartments that's going to help a lot but uh, it's it has been a problem area but we're, we're trying to have as much police presence as we can to, to fix it. Lieutenant how about from the Metro uh, Transit Police perspective here? It, it is a stress point. Um, Green Line opened in June of 2014. Um, you know we kind of rehabbed that area put in the vertical tower into the Skyway and one of the biggest things I talk about all the time is when we're doing proactive law enforcement uh, um, details and things of that nature, that you kind of create unintended consequences. And I don't think anyone saw that that was going to be such a focal point after the completion of the Central Quarter project. And we've worked well with St. Paul Police to, to own that, that area. Um, when you talk about that perspect, uh, perception of, of, of what it's like there, well, when you look at numbers, it doesn't look bad, but you have that one bad experience, you know, that everyone always remembers how you made them feel. Sure. And uh, that's the biggest thing is that, is that quality of life aspect of it. 
What have we done at Metro Transit about it? We've, um, last year we added two extra officers. We, we have two officers dedicated there, primarily in the afternoons. Last year we added uh, two extra officers on our morning light rail beat, and we, keep, we had kept them downtown in 2017, essentially to try to help with some of the issues in the mornings. But you get, they get called away to, to other things and so forth. What we've done this spring, or starting on January 1st, is we added two more full-time officers strictly to work day shift down there. So you're getting two in the day, two in the afternoon, and uh, then we're supplementing other staffing there um, throughout the day and the period. Um, last year, there was a little over 5,000 calls for service in that area from Cedar to Minnesota Street along Fifth Street. That, that sounds area. like a lot. It does sound like a lot, but when you break down what those calls for service are, um, over 50% of them are, are what we would refer to at the police department as proactive police visits. Those are officers checking out on the air saying, hey, I'm down in this area, and um, here's what we're doing. So we didn't get 5,000 citizen-initiated calls. With the increase, though, in all our staffing down there and with the help of St. Paul Police, um, our citizen calls for service. So when you folks are out there and you're having issues and problems, those have dropped about 12%, but the officer-initiated activity has gone up about um, 35%, I think it was, 37%. Um, since 2016. So basically, the more boots you put on the ground down there, the better it works out for all of us. But you fellas don't think it's enough to keep folks from using that station, do you? I, I go through there three or four times a week, and I mean, I, I've never seen a, a problem. I, I wonder if the perception really is worse than the reality, maybe. Anybody want to? I, I can touch a little bit on that also. I mean, it, there were flashpoint issues that happened, you know, after Green Line opening, and we, yeah, we did have to go down there and make a few changes, and um, just kind of educate people on on the using the transit system and mm -hmm. hanging out in the Skyway system up there, and that just getting the word out has helped tremendously, and having uh, people use the pager system and calling into on those complaints helps. Well, well, Commander, what about the Skyway? There were some new rule changes in there. Has that uh, borne some good fruit? Or uh, how, how do you sense that uh, the Skyway changes are, are working if they are? As far as the Skyways... Um, Point a little bit toward your... There you go. All right. Thanks. Yeah, as, as far as the Skyways go, um, like uh, Tony had said, um, we've, we've been really upticking the number of police officers we have in the Skyways, and we call them PPVs, which are proactive police visits. Um, we've been working with DSI as far as the, which is the department of, uh, it's the city inspection department. We work with them, they kind of control the ordinances in the Skyways. Um, so we've been able to use what we have uh, as, as far as uh, helping us, I guess, clear out the Skyways and hit the, hit the hot spots. Um, we've had, some issues with the panhandling ordinance. It, it, it's something that we used to be able to use when we get complaints about panhandling. There's a recent Supreme Court decision that deemed uh, all of our, not our, um, across the country, these ordinances as unconstitutional. And of course the critics of them say that it uh, gives police a little too much latitude to maybe make a, a false arrest or to, uh, implicit I, I, bias and all that stuff. I, I think it has more to do with the, uh, the free speech. Mm -hmm. um, so I know the county or uh, the city attorney is actively working on a response to that. They're trying to create something that we're going to be able to use in its place um, that, uh, that will be within the law um, and constitutional. Um, Mike, do you have anything to add about the Skyway? No, the, the revised ordinance really has, uh, there's a little more teeth to it. Mm -hmm. And it's a little bit more that we can enforce some of the quality of life issues, whether it's uh, people that are, uh, loitering, whether it's people that are panhandling, whether it's people that uh, have been warned repeatedly on trespass-related issues. So the new ordinance, in I've only been downtown six months, so I'm still very much learning myself. But it is a it is a much improved uh, revision as to what the previous Skyway ordinance was. Bill, I'm going to break format a little bit. And it, it, does that strike you what you're what you're seeing on the ground or in the in the Skyway as residents? Improvement, same, worse. Yeah. Improvement. Any suggestions as to what would e even be more helpful or? And speak up real loud because B Bill isn't over there with the mic. So yeah, go ahead.
Right, you're, you're talking about the ambassadors, and that's the city of St. Paul has them, uh, citizens that go up there, and they're kind of a bridge. Uh, they're not, they don't have a badge that they're saying, we're with the police department, but they're just to, to work with the youth who not are, aren't always excited to talk to the police. And, and we see them, and it, it works great. They're out there, they, 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 they're a safe public uh, figure, authoritarian authority that they can talk to and feel safe to so it takes we usually try to stay away from them we get along with them we talk to them kind of in private but uh, they just don't want to be it kind of ruins their street cred a little bit but they are fantastic out there and, and that's really helped they're, a lot of times they're right by the the vertical tower as we call it central station but uh, that's helped a lot others want to weigh in on this one i've got if you more. if you have questions you can come down here so yeah. that uh, we or, can or just yell real loud I think. well because the or, spnn or spin thing is, yeah spin so is. if you can come down here that would really be helpful yeah while you're coming down, I'll ask another one. Uh, I, I, I have one other thing, though. The, yeah. The pager system is fantastic, um, but it does take some getting used to. You dial that number, and you hear the most unusual set of clicks and pops and squeals, and then at some point it stops and you just talk. Uh, it is, I, I would just rec recommend, uh, I use it a bunch, and the, the, the cops are really responsive. So That's great. I think it's really, really great advice. If I can add something about, about, about the pager. This is fantastic. It is the pager that you had in the 1970s. But uh, again, all of, all of the downtown beat officers wear one. And it, if you're confused, if you're scared, don't think, I need to look that up. I can't call 911 because the, the guy doesn't have a gun pointing at me. Call 911. If, if you're scared, you're scared. Call 911. Also, uh, we've all heard this for years where people said, oh, I was going to call the cops the other day, and I, I felt bad. I didn't want to bother them. If you're bothering us and we've got so many things going on, we'll, we'll just have to get to it a little, little bit later. But please call. If, if I'd rather have you call than us put it a little bit behind than you, for you to not call at all. Here's a question in the crowd, Bill. Yep, go ahead. Uh, question for Metro Transit Police. When uh, some months ago we were taking the Green Line into Minneapolis and there was a gentleman in the seat behind us who was uh, almost conscious. He fell out of the seat once as we went around a curve. We put him back in his seat. Uh, and, you know, he, it looked like he was sleeping, but we were concerned. I stood there so he didn't fall out again. Uh, finally, he urinated all over the back of the train. And my question is, at what point, out of concern for him as well as the rest of us, should I have gone up and pushed the red button and asked the engineer if he could contact you folks? I would completely encourage people to use the, the services on the, on the light rail. Um, there is an emergency button on each light rail vehicle um, that does put you in contact with the operator and then they can get a hold of our rail control center who essentially talks to our police dispatchers. Um, and when you're on a light rail vehicle, if you look at kind of the driver's door, you'll see a number on there. It'll be 203A, B, C. Those are important things that we would need to know also. But one of the other things that, that's very relevant to uh, a call like that is it kind of gets back to the pager system. Metro Transit has just pushed out a new text to TCC, it's called. So if you use text messaging at all, if you're on a, on a bus or a light rail vehicle and you don't feel comfortable you know, making that that 911 call where it's you and maybe a group of others that you don't feel comfortable with. That phone number is 612-900-0411. That way you can kind of anonymously call in and say, hey, I'm on this vehicle. This gentleman, I think, needs some help. Um, and you're that a, a police dispatcher is actually answering that cell phone text. So so that's not inappropriate to call 911 for something like that? Absolutely not. Okay. No, that, okay. Uh, that person might need you know, immediate medical yeah. assistance. The number is 612-900-0411. You know, the last measurement was that there were 1,800 homeless in Ramsey County, and I'm sure the vast majority of those folks are in St. Paul or close by, and you have the downtown facilities for those folks, and uh, in the cold weather in particular, those light rail trains overnight become kind of a de facto homeless shelter because you, you see the folks sleeping on there. And uh, 
you know, you, you feel badly for them because if they have nowhere else to go, it's at least a warm place. Yeah, it, the, everyone's kind of dealing with the homeless uh, dilemma. It's, it is a big issue in society right now. I just had a meeting today with some folks from uh, Radius Health and People Incorporated. They have a project called Outside In. On Wednesday mornings, we've actually been bringing a, a Metro Transit bus down to Union Depot Station and working with outreach workers down there to try to get services for these folks. Obviously, it's, uh, you know, it, you get a, you can see up to a few hundred people on the trains yeah, every night sleeping. That's sure. uh, a realistic number. And it is, it's where are we going to find places for these folks to go? But I guess if we keep chipping away at it, a little bit of, at a time, we should be able to come up with some type of a solution. Well, society dumps these problems on you guys, and you're stuck with <laughs> protecting yeah. us. Uh, in the last budget, I, I think the, the number was, uh, I think the council added six new police officers citywide and a new mental health unit. A and maybe the mental health unit might be a particular application downtown. Can you talk a little bit about what that uh, unit is going to do or is doing? Sure. Yeah, the, uh, the new me mental health unit is uh, run by um, Officer Jamie Seitz. He, uh, he has kind of made it one of his uh, priorities in his policing career. I think he's got 20 or so uh, policing years on, so he's got a lot of experience, and it's something that he's kind of taken to heart, and um, I, I believe Officer Seitz was the one who came up with the idea and uh, brought it to the administration. and. Um, they were fully behind it, 100%, and they've added three police officers, one assigned to each district under Officer Sipes. Um, and they, it hasn't been up and running for too long, but they've done a fantastic job already um, dealing, when officers are dealing with people that are possibly mentally ill or there's some type of um, issue related with that, uh, they'll come out to the scene. They have uh, specific training um, to deal with situations like that they're uh, they come out right to the scene if, if officers need it if they hear something on the radio that they think may deal with it they'll respond to it um, and we're gonna be leaning on them a lot downtown because uh, as lieutenant grades mentioned the uh, it's the homelessness is a bit of a dilemma right now and um, I know a lot of it has to do with uh, mental illness and yeah. mental health of the people that we deal with um, so as far as our new mental health unit, I think it's going to be great for not only the police department, but the city and downtown as a whole. What, what is your, your fellow's experience of uh, mental illness or drug or alcohol uh, uh, addiction as uh, the gateway to the problems that these, these fellows uh, provide for us? It, it's something I learned years ago. I was I, prior to this. I was a, at a different agency, and I said, at, at this certain area, I said, "Well, how many people here have mental illness?" And and the lady said, uh, "Well, they all do. It's all just varying degrees." And that's what we, we deal with. And this mental health unit is, is fantastic. And, and a lot of things that they do is kind of behind the scenes. Like they work on a certain uh, person that we have constant problems with. There are several people, and they work with the hospital about giving, getting a civil commitment and getting them the help they need because arresting them isn't a solution. And, and we get called and, and they've got th their issues and then us showing up, we're, we're kind of a band-aid approach, and, mm -hmm. and, uh, but it's, it's fantastic. We're just getting them the help that they need. When I speak to classes, and women, you women in the audience will enjoy this, I, I usually tell classes that if it weren't for men making bad decisions, the nightly newscast would be about 25 seconds long. <laughs> John Manolo has a question. Yeah. <clears throat> um, as far as parks downtown uh, and the homeless, uh, it's not illegal for a homeless person to use a park, uh, but it comes a point, if they're setting up camp or whatever it is, when it, it becomes a problem. Uh, when is that and what should people do? Commander, that's, yes, th that's been a, um, an issue that repeats every year. We do have a city ordinance about encampments, um, but it's kind of hard to enforce how it's, uh, how it's set up right now. We do have, uh, in the Central District, two police officers who are assigned to the force unit. They work on the day shift, uh, Officer John Filowich and Officer David Quast. They work with DSI, which is inspections again. And once we get reports of this, um, by all means, if, if you're in the park and there's some kind of issue, you can call the pager or you can call non-emergency number, you can call 911. 
Um, but let us know that it's happening. What the force unit does, Officer Filowich and Klaas, they work with DSI, they'll go down to these parks. As you had said, anybody can use the park, but the park rules apply. So when the park is closed, they're not supposed to be there. There's, their camp isn't supposed to be there. They're not supposed to have a pile of stuff there. So what they do, they go to, with DSI and they'll talk to whoever they find down there that's possibly camping. Um, they give them a 48 hour notice. Um, they can write them a citation. Once that 48 hours is up, they'll come back and they're, uh, they're able to confiscate whatever is down there. Um, so we do have people who deal specifically with that. Um, I believe the city attorney is possibly working on an ordinance that would be uh, more easily enforced. Um, but when you're using the parks, just if you see a problem or you want to report something, don't, don't be afraid to call us. And we have people that can come down and deal with that specifically. Uh, is the pager good for that as well? Absolutely. How much discretion do the street officers have? I, I, you've got the laws and kind of procedures, but you, you folks have, do you have pretty wide discretion on a case-by-case -case basis, or is it a, just a judgment call once you're there on the street at the scene of whatever's going on, or <clears throat> maybe help people understand kind of your mindset as you, as you go through uh, sure. an enforcement uh, problem? Sure. So in response to a call where officers encounter someone, whether it's in the parks or in the skyways or in the downtown area, the officers have a great amount of latitude in how the contact goes, and generally speaking, we want it to be a favorable contact and we've got an intended outcome and we're formulating our plan based on what we know as we approach and the goal typically is to gain voluntary compliance, right? That's the term we use, gain voluntary compliance and if it's to please uh, stand up and keep moving, that's the ask. If it is to please uh, gather up your belongings and keep moving, that's the ask, and we'll spend a good amount of time building a very quick rapport, and in some instances, on familiar faces and names, relationships, and afford somebody the benefit of the doubt or a break. If somebody is, uh, you know, uh, instead of a ticket, if you're polite and cooperative and willing to move on, you're probably gonna avoid the ticket. So it's that voluntary compliance piece that we strive for. If it isn't that we gain that voluntary compliance, then we have some additional uh, tools on our tool belt. Sure. I have a couple of random questions which have always <laughs> made me curious. Somebody talk about the use of the segways. Um, they're tall, they get you above people. Uh, they move fast, but there's enough stairs in the system that it would seem to be that it would cause uh, some problems as well. So somebody talk about the use of the segways, and I understand that there's some, you know, hope that there will be some additional segways on the skyways. Uh, I'll speak to that briefly. I think I'm, I, do you use it? Yeah, yeah, not, yeah. so I'm the only one on the, Rick, do you have segways? We, we do no. not have okay. segways. Down. So I don't know if people are familiar with the segways, but it's a really neat tool, and uh, just like Bill described, it uh, is a battery-operated vehicle that allows you to buzz in and around the skyways. And uh, there are four brand new segways on the way assigned specifically to the downtown beat. And although they're primarily seen in the skyways, some of the more skilled operators can maneuver the elevators, the escalators, and take them out onto the ground level. Perhaps you've seen them. I'm seeing some heads shaking up and down that they've seen them. Mm -hmm. um, we only have one that's operational right now, uh, but the hope is that this next batch of four will be here uh, soon, and you'll see us out all over the place on our new segways. So a nice tool, uh, quicker response than walking, uh, in a lot of instances quicker than a vehicle response if you're not already in a vehicle to go down and get into the loading dock and head out and invariably have to take another elevator up. So a really, really slick tool for uh, rapid response within the Skyway system. For Lieutenant Grapes and Sergeant Nicola, 
is it the same culprits time after time uh, for like lifestyle type stuff or is it uh, out of towners or groups from Minneapolis that come over or do you kind of know the usual suspects kind of or? Well, I know from a transit perspective, uh, the system is so large yet um, we do kind of have that frequent flyer list um, that, that we deal with. And why can't they be better controlled? Or why can't, or why, why can't their uh, behavior be, uh, have I some consequences? The, if I had the answer for that, I probably wouldn't be sitting on this <laughs> okay. panel right now. Yeah. But, um, you know, we just, we do our best to try to deal with those situations and use whatever means we can to, to help make it better on the, on the transit system. And, it, you know, it, it goes, we have that on transit system. I'm sure each district in St. Paul has their problem persons, but you have to use the resources available. You have to use your specific uh, city attorney assigned to your area, sure, uh, yeah. maybe probation or, or uh, health or human services, all those things. Just on the beat, Sergeant, I, I suppose you do find similar faces turning up? We, we do. It's a little bit of both. And, and we can trespass people or, or a business can trespass them, but what we also have is a stay away order, and that's for a full year. And for example, if somebody was continually coming to this place, we'd say within a, a two block radius, you cannot come here, and the city attorney's behind it. And, and anytime they come inside of it, we can arrest them. So okay. that, that's a nice tool. So we have a lot of the people that we see a lot of the time, the, the similar people, but also since there's so many events and so many more events coming down, people come to St. Paul from out of, out of state and it's their time to get as intoxicated as they humanly can. And sure. and we get a lot of that, that too. So it's- As it's more a, it's events come downtown, the greater the possibility for mischief, right. I suppose. Yeah. Right. Bill? My name is Pat Erlinson, and I have lived downtown for a number of years. And about that number of years, I've been a volunteer at homeless shelters. And you just answered your own, one of you asked the question, the other one answered it. And that is, they are mentally ill, many of these people, or have addiction right. problems. And so you were saying, you know, are these the same people? Well, of course they are because they haven't had medical attention that they can get. Their medical attention usually is going into an emergency room and we know how expensive that is, but if that you have no other place to go. Right. I am also a part of Listening House right now and they are struggling and I think probably many of you have read about them in the paper about the fact that they are not wanted where they are. Mm -hmm. And where are they wanted? No place, I guess. But it is, you know, you're answering your, your questions here, but know that they are dear people, that they have been dealt some difficult hands and made some very poor choices, ended up with felonies, and can't get a job and can't get housing, but but they're in that position and they need all of us to help you and I'm glad to hear about some of the things that you're doing. Well, a, a, a holistic approach with housing and therapy and all of that stuff would be good, but I, I don't know that, do you have a relationship with the nonprofits downtown and with the hospitals and some of the places that might provide some of these services or could that be enhanced a little bit or, Commander? Uh, or I can touch real quick because so much of it is in the transit side and I, there's a couple of different variances to this because especially with the groups that are homeless on transit it was funny when I started going down in the mornings and talking to some of these folks I kind of got an answer that I didn't think I was going to get and I said why are you always on the green line train at night well I feel safe here hmm. they didn't want to go to certain shelters and so forth I, I do believe what you're saying there is uh, there's a lack of places for people to go where they would feel safe and um, ironically even working with St. Paul and, and Transit and working with Radius Health in some of these places, um, a lot of the people that we're per se dealing with on the transit side here are Hennepin County folks that maybe have had services over there. And Radius or Ramsey County cannot provide the services for them. So it, it's really going to take a lot of bigger effort um, geographically to, to help solve that. Uh, Sergeant, you want to come in on, on this, the, the kind of the relationship with the nonprofits and the folks with the addictions and so forth? And well, it, it's really turned around recently where all, every officer in the entire department of St. Paul needs to be uh, critical, um, the critical incident, what is it, CIT training, team training. And, and what that is, it's a full week, 40 hours that every officer goes through and we speak with people from 
all these different shelters, former vets, people that are, that are struggling. We go to, to different um, homeless shelters, and it, it's, a, it's a really, really good perspective for officers who, who've been, been doing this for years just to see that side and to know the people that we're working with. And we have a lot more people to refer to in a lot more places now, but they're struggling too because there's only so much, so many spaces for them to go. Sure. So, but but it's, it, we're a lot better trained than we have been in the past. Hi. <clears throat> My name's Chris Tomford. I live on Wakuta Commons. <clears throat> and so thank you. You've been very responsive to coming there. I would call most of the stuff sort of high-level annoyance, not crime. I grew up in New York City, so I'm maybe uh, immune to <laughs> overt violence. But uh, two questions. One, uh, what I don't know what the uh, city of St. Paul's Police Department or the Metro Transit uh, position is on the use of deadly force, and uh, that's obviously a major national kind of crisis that we all live through, so I'd be interested to learn more about that from you all. And uh, it's a friendly question, not an antagonistic one. And then secondly, is there, are there issues that you face that we might be helpful for, hel helpful in addressing or dealing with and so forth? So thank you. Commander, deadly force, uh, I guess there's a new, uh, hasn't the policy been tweaked a little bit or? Yes, our, uh, our use of force policy was uh, recently changed quite a bit. Um, we, we had several members of the training unit. Um, we worked with outside agencies. Uh, I know they did a lot of work in this past year um, to update that. I am not a uh, use of force expert. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't want to speak too much about that. Um, How does it affect the beat cops? Uh, yeah, so, so our use of force policy was updated and we sent everybody in the department through the uh, new training. Mm -hmm. um, we have new policies and procedures put into place and uh, I think it's been received very well with, with the police officers. It's something that um, our use of force policy needed and the, the officers who worked on it did a really great job. I believe if you want to, uh, if you want to look at it or read it, you can go on to the St. Paul Police Department website and uh, <coughs> read about any changes that were made. Um, okay. How about uh, body cameras? While we're on the subject of new, uh, you 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 street guys use the the body cameras or? Right there, there it is. We all have to <coughs> every time we're, Sh we're show show the folks. Uh, can you see that? It's just uh, on on the. Well, Every single officer has to have this on and functioning and recording when we are in contact with a citizen. So it's really changed the dynamics for those of us that have been around for a while, where if the four of us are on a call and these two are dealing with the unsavory character like yourself at the end there. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> I've been known to act out. We're in the back. We could talk about what we did last weekend, what we're doing next week, and whatever else. And now we're being recorded. And, and just it, it cleans things up a little bit, and it just it shows what the person's doing. And, um, and if there's any evidence or if they show, if, if they're uh, making some comments or doing some things they shouldn't, then we, we have evidence against them. Or well, if they yeah. later come back and make a complaint, so the officer was very rude, and then we'll say, well, check the tape. Let's go to the tape. Right, right. And then the, the questioner asked a little bit about, is there some pet peeve with law-abiding citizens that they could change to help you guys out? And you, you mentioned the pager system. Is there anything else that uh, you want to get off your chest that these law-abiding folks could help you out a little more than they do? I, I just think that we can't fix things unless we hear about them. So keep there you hammering go. away at us and letting us know where the problems are and so we can put our resources there. Good. Hello, I'm Kathleen Conger. I'm a librarian at the George Latimer Central Library. And I wanted to piggyback on what Pat was saying about homelessness and mental illness and drug and alcohol abuse. Many people who are experiencing homelessness, have mental illness, and are self-medicating with drugs and alcohol, which is why the two go hand in hand many times. At the Central Library, we are striving to create a welcoming environment because we're very close to the higher ground. Uh, and so we offer computers. We have our innovation lab, which is we'll be talking about later. Um, and many of our members are experiencing homelessness. 
And also once a week, we host what we call CROP. It stands for Community Resource Outreach Project, where the library puts on the coffee and opens our doors to uh, organizations that serve people who are in need. So People Incorporated, Radius Health, our regulars, they are there every week. We also have, uh, it's, it's not just for people experiencing homelessness, but many of the people who come and use the services are experiencing homelessness. So I wanted to bring that up that homeless people are part of our community and the library is striving to create a welcoming environment for everybody in the community. Thanks. Thank you. And as far as outreach, you guys have coffee with a cop and you have the <coughs> periodic community meetings, I think pretty regularly scheduled. So, um, But I think what we've learned here tonight, Bill Hanley, is that this is a human resource problem as much as anything. You take away the mental illness and the drugs and the alcohol and you, these guys would not have as much to do. I mean, I don't, I'm, not, I'm not saying that to be funny. I'm, I just really think that's what's going on in, in large measure. But, uh, you know, I just... Uh, somebody who walks around the skyways a lot and who uh, walks around the parks a lot, um, it is so much better than it was a couple of years ago. I mean, it's, it is, uh, you know, there's still DSI kind of issues, messy stuff and all of that that we've got to pay attention to. But in terms of the actual acting out stuff, I mean, I, I feel like it's a vastly improved downtown environment. That's great. Uh, Larry Wick, a resident of uh, Lower Town. I'm also a co coordinator co coordinator of Friends of Mears Park. We have 50 garden plots in the park and over 100 uh, gardeners. And last year we uh, heard more comments from people about the behavior of the people in the park. And we're, your two suggestions on the pager and text messaging I think will be a great help to our people. Tell them if you see anything that bothers you down there, immediately use those two <coughs> things because we have people last year that I think just quit gardening and won't walk through the park. So the other question I have is oh, the increased presence in downtown and the skyways and that, is there any plans to have increased presence in some of the parks like Mirrors and Rice and Lakota Park? Well one thing we recently did is we added a second sergeant. Mike, Mike is the, the day shift sergeant. I'm one of the two afternoon sergeants so it just helps getting more officers. Uh, a couple more sergeants and then we're also adding one more sergeant we have two different shifts that work together the segways are gonna be fantastic because they are they're, they're fast people want to talk to us everyone the kids at the at the, the tower want to talk everyone if there's a cop standing there they may people may see them or look at them if there's one on the segway everyone's either giggling or smiling or, or laughing or want to talk to them so that's really gonna help us just cover a lot more territory. Well, it helps your presence there. much like a, a mounted officer would in that yeah. you're above the fray just a little bit. And, right, yeah. right. Except we have a lot of big guys and they have to duck going through <laughs> all the doors. So. Sure. But, but that's really going to help us get out to the parks a lot more. Granted, yeah. Rice is going to be uh, tore up most of the year. Yeah. Right. But th and, and so, you know, when we go to these parks for complaints, it, we can't just throw these people out. Like yeah. They said they complained and we, you know, the cops just went there, talked to them, then they left. A lot of times we can't do anything. We can identify them. We can let them know, hey, guys, knock it off, or we're going to have to ask you to leave, or we'll give you a ticket. But um, be patient with us, but we'll, we'll help you out as much as we can. Sure. One last question. I, I just want to ask about the streets. I'm hearing about the skyways, and I'm hearing about the transit system. I spend a fair amount of time, like, out on the actual street. I never see a police officer. Um, when I did need help, um, because I was actually robbed downtown, um, uh, the police officers that responded didn't even know the area. I mean, when I explained where the young man ran with my purse, I could totally tell they didn't know what I was talking about. So can we talk just a little bit about um, what policing is like for people that might be walking, like to their office or home or, you know, outside downtown? Street During crime. the day, even. Okay. A commander, you want to? Or yeah, Mike? Uh, fair question. So you're right. We probably do emphasize our uh, Skyway efforts a little bit more. Uh, but the men and women assigned, assigned to the downtown beat have the responsibility for covering the street level as well. And uh, this is a good reminder that perhaps we need to spend a little more time outside and on the sidewalks and in these. Uh, entry level, garden level uh, areas. 
Um, if you get an officer that isn't familiar with the area, that is suggestive of the fact that you don't have an officer from the downtown beat assisting you. And it is well within reason to suggest that, hey, I'm calling at 6th in Minnesota, do you have someone assigned to the downtown beat available to assist me? <clears throat> and uh, to that point, downtown is about as easily laid out as any part of town, and it's unfortunate that you had that experience. Um, yeah, good, good reminder. And starting tomorrow, I'll see to it that we're going to spend a little more time outside. Very serious. <clears throat> um, very serious. There's lots of places. Lots of, I've walked downtown all my life. It's getting to the point where it's getting to the point where I feel I'm just not comfortable doing it anymore. So, um, and I want to keep walking downtown. Yes, and if, to that point, if it's 4th in Minnesota, or if it's 10th in Robert, or if it's 6th in Washington, give a call, give a call, because it is that response-driven reaction that you'll get from us. We, we are coming, we will be there. And if we hear it often enough, it becomes a routine part of our, uh, patrols. You were very generous with your time. We really appreciate you coming. How about give these fellows a hand and thank them. Thanks. Okay. Thanks very much, Commander. Very good. Enjoy. You bet. You bet. Great. Thanks, Sergeant. You bet. Nice to see you. Nekami. Lieutenant. Thanks. Now we go to John and Peg for some uh, more information. Good evening, neighbors. Good evening, Mr. Manillo. So for this edition of 55101 around downtown, the official name of this segment, we thought we'd stick to some lesser known but still wonderful things that to enjoy in our downtown neighborhood. So I have a question. Are there people in this room who have been to the Baroque Room? Anybody know the Baroque Room? There, there, yes. Um, I'm a big fan of the Baroque Room. This is a terrific performance space. It's kind of hidden away on the second floor of the Northwestern Building down in Lower Town. It's a very intimate little concert hall, very intimate, wonderful space for experiencing chamber music. They do a free lunchtime concert series. The next one is on April the 20th, and on May the 5th, they're working with the Bach Society to present a keyboard evening with Ilya Politaev, who was the first prize winner at the Bach competition in Leipzig, uh, the Baroque Room. And oh yes, you can rent the room for your own concerts and events if you want, the Baroque Room in Lower Town. Okay, and here's another fun thing you may not know about yet. Everybody knows about book clubs, right? Where you go sit in your friend's living room, you all read the same book and you can talk about it all at the same time. There's something called Books and Bars, and it's a public book club where you sit with people in a bar and talk about books. <laughs> uh, that's exciting with these, sometimes after about four drinks, you can, there's, there's a fun host and people speak up, give their opinions about the books and hear other opinions. They do an event <coughs> at the Amsterdam, which is right downtown at 6th and Wabashaw. Um, it'll be there on May 1st, the book that they're going to be discussing on the 1st is All the Ugly and Wonderful Things by Bryn Greenwood. It was a New York Times and USA Today bestseller. You can buy it at our downtown bookstore, Subtext. Books and bars, it's free, and you just walk in. Now this one doesn't really qualify as something that's lesser known, but if you have never gotten out and around to the St. Paul Art Crawl, it's coming up the weekend after next. It, we know this, right? It's a kind of a massive open studio tour. 300, I think, artists showing their work and talking about it. And I read that last year there were 17 buildings in Lower Town and Downtown that were involved in the art crawl. That doesn't count the studios up along uh, University, along 280, the end of 280, and on the east and west side both, and the Schmidt Brewery on West 7th Street. It's a really glorious way to spend some time talking to artists and looking at work and also seeing r some really interesting architecture and studio spaces. Free rides on Metro Transit for that weekend. St. Paul Art Crawl, something for everyone, and it's all free, April 27, 28, and 29. 
Well, spring is busy in St. Paul. Yes, spring. <laughs> Everybody knows the beautiful J.J. Hill Library up on Rice Park, but you may not know that they regularly host, right there in the stacks, a show called the Mysterious Old Radio Listening Society. Great shows from the golden age of radio. This live show restages the great horror and suspense shows from the golden age with five actors playing multiple roles and producing all of the sound effects. Their next date is April 29th, Sunday afternoon at 3.30. There's a pre-show music uh, by Kings of Coal and you'll never sit in a more beautiful room than the James J. Hill Center. We also want to point out a special Tuesday lunchtime program. This is happening on the 1st of May. This is a free hour in Landmark Center with the St. Paul Ballet. You bring your lunch and you get, you know, a taste of the ballet's repertoire. They're doing excerpts from Carmen. Which they're presenting the full ballet on the 12th and 13th of May at the O'Shaughnessy. But neighbors, we have the opportunity for a free preview of Carmen at noon on the 1st of May at Landmark Center. Bring your lunch. This new Carmen, I read, is uh, set in the 1920s. So high anticipation for this from the St. Paul Ballet. So one of the really great St. Paul yearly celebrations is coming up on the 5th of May. It's huge, it's family friendly, and it's just across the river. It's a parade that will start at 10 a.m. with floats and music and dancers and costumes. There's live entertainment and a community village market for handcrafts made by local artists. It's less than a mile away, very walkable, free, and very fun. Cinco de Mayo. On, you know, Cinco de Mayo. St. Paul Chamber Orchestra, one of the great chamber ensembles in the world of classical music, has a huge concert schedule. But we wanted to point out one lesser known advantage of being neighbors with the chamber orchestra. They do open rehearsals, and on Wednesday, April the 25th, at 7 o'clock at the Ordway, there's an open rehearsal with Patricia Kopachinskaya as she prepares a concert, which is opening the next night. Ms. Kopachinskaya is one of the chamber orchestra's artistic partners. This is an opportunity to see the process about how these concerts come together. So they play, they stop, they talk, they shape, they fix it, they play again. It's fascinating. And it's in the concert hall, the, what, what some people call the small hall at the Ordway, another very beautiful space. Fascinating, and I think it's $10 to sit in at the open rehearsal. Oh, and I want to talk about a quick update from Creative St. Paul. Last time we met together, we heard from those folks, and they report that they have a collective, we know that they have a collective of arts, cultural, and creative organizations, and they're putting together the uh, tremendous calendar of events, which I think you can find, yes, at creativestpaul.org. And also, look at a, at a download of their free app, which is called Du Jour, at the App Store on your smartphone to stay on top of local events, and du jour is spelled like that, du jour. And here's another quick update. <clears throat> the uh, Treasure Island Center, Tim Hortons, think Canadian version of Dunkin' Donuts, <laughs> is scheduled to open the first week in May. Oh. Yeah, well, even better, Cancun Billy's, <laughs> a Mexican barbecue bar and restaurant, they hope to open by late summer. And that huge, huge hockey mural up, up on the side of the building, Sixth and Cedar, should finally be done by the end of April, or at least by the next Super Bowl. <laughs> and again, all this is at Treasure Island Center, not far from downtown, but feels far away when you get there, is Holman's Table. It's a more upscale restaurant at our downtown airport terminal just across the river. And afterwards, you can catch a plane and really get away. <laughs> La Loma, the tamale shop in Town Square, after being closed for six months, is back by public demand. And I have to mention Rice Park. It's set for a $2.3 million revitalization whenever spring arrives, with an official start of construction on May 17th, set to be completed in late fall, but it will be closed this season. Speaking of parks, there will be 
three input meetings, quote, input meetings, of the Pedro Park Design Advisory Committee for April, May, and June. Information for these meetings is going out tomorrow morning. So we want to talk a little bit about what's, <coughs> what's playing in downtown St. Paul right now. The History Theater, we know this is where we're sitting right now, has a new musical they're coming up on the 5th of May. We're sitting on their set right now for a show that just closed on Sunday. All of this that you see behind us will be disappearing starting tomorrow morning and going out into, uh, uh, into uh, maybe another life or maybe just the afterlife as a set. So the new musical they're doing is called Lord Gordon Gordon, and it's brought to you by the same creative team that mounted Glenn Sheen, which has been extremely popular on this stage. Has anybody seen Glenn Sheen? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And Glenn Sheen is coming back again this summer, I believe. Karen, is that right? That's right. That's right. Glenn Sheen will return. So the story, Lord Gordon Gordon, is the story of an actual con man, I love this story, who arrived in Minnesota in 1871 impersonating a Scottish lord, named himself Lord Gordon Gordon, and swindled a great number of well-to-do Minnesotans before he was done. Lord Gordon Gordon, and it opens on the 5th of May here at the History Theater. So Park Square, just a few blocks away, right? I'm told they only have four more performances of a show called The Diary of Anne Frank, with which you might be familiar. Uh, they're going on then to a Sherlock Holmes piece, but the reason you might be familiar with it is that they've been doing the math over at Park Square, and over the last 19 years they have done 797 performances of Anne Frank. It's a very durable and very good title for that theater, and their audience has been nearly 250,000 people over that time. Diary of Anne Frank, it closes on April the 28th. The new music organization Zeitgeist, does everybody know about Zeitgeist down in Lower Town? You might want to check this out. They're celebrating their 40th anniversary on the weekend of May the 4th with a concert in their Lower Town space which is called Studio Z. This is another one of these wonderful little concert halls that is in the upper floors of some of those beautiful buildings in Lower Town. So, so Zeitgeist, since 1977, has commissioned the more than 400 new works of music. It's definitely worthy of celebration. Zeitgeist, the 40th anniversary celebration. And in a bigger house, and in a much more conventional musical form, the Minnesota Opera is presenting Thais at the Ordway. That run is from May the 12th to May the 20th. Now, I love the opera, and I love opera plots, which are often complex and overheated and there's a lot happening in the opera plots. So I wrote down the, the plot summary for Thais to read to you. Here's, here's what Thais is about. A devout monk seeks to convert Thais, a ravishingly beautiful courtesan, but realizes too late that his pious obsession is rooted in lust, not religion. <laughs> It happens to everybody. I mean, come on. <laughs> and it's set in fourth century Egypt. Fourth century Egypt. So that's Thais with the Minnesota Opera uh, from May 12th to May the 20th. Well, and I have good news too. Music and Mirrors will be back this summer for its 15th season. <laughs> It'll be held every Thursday evening starting June 7th. And other than the week of July 4th, it'll run through August 30th, all free with different kinds of live music. Now that's a beautiful way to spend a summer evening in the park. And that is the news from our downtown neighborhood. Megan John, give it up for him. The downtown live crew really spared no expense and has gathered together the cream of the downtown volunteer coordinating crop to tell us about uh, summertime volunteer activities. Now, do you, have your, do you know your seat assignments? All right. There was a very uh, intricate choreography to this whole thing. All right. Everybody in their place, sort of? Hi, hi, gang. All right, let's start with uh, Jenny Reinhardt from the Landmark Center. A lot of free programs and volunteer activities coming up. Yes, um, Landmark Center is a Ramsey County owned building managed by a nonprofit that I work for called Minnesota Landmarks. 
and we are in charge of the building and it is the mission of Ramsey County and Minnesota Landmarks to keep the building open and accessible to everyone in the community and to provide free and low cost community programming throughout the year. In order for us to do that, we depend very heavily on volunteer support, which is very fitting considering the building was actually saved because the community cared enough to save it and the community is what carries us forward every day. I have um, a variety of places where people can get involved at Landmark Center. Many of them are actually ongoing year round, so not summer specific. Our Visitor Information Center is a really good um, place to be if you love downtown St. Paul, if you love Minnesota, if you love all of the cultural events that we have, all the museums, all the buildings, all the music in the parks and everything that we have going on. Um, we serve Last year in 2017, we saw 170,000, actually over 170,000 visitors uh, came to our visitor center. And um, probably one of the most common questions that we get down there is, I have a couple hours in St. Paul, what should I do? So if you have a passion for St. Paul and you feel that you could answer that question and you have a variety of things that you think people should see, um, that would be a good place uh, to consider volunteering. Uh, we operate the desk um, every day of the week, and shifts are three hours. We usually ask that you just pick up two shifts a month, if possible. And um, age limit or requirements along those lines, or limit? You mean the age out of this? <laughs> you need, need to be 18, or uh, 18 would be preferable. Um, All right. And then um, another volunteer opportunity that we have is we operate a nonprofit gift shop. And the proceeds that we make in the gift shop help support the funding of our community programs. And it also serves as a place for tourists to come buy postcards, little souvenirs, but also for the downtown folks to be able to buy a quick gift. Um, we know that retail is kind of struggling in downtown, so uh, Landmark Center has a great gift shop. And mm -hmm. tours. We offer tours of the building, and those are also operated by volunteers. So if you love architectural history, um, love an audience, uh, that's a good place to start too. Do you know anything about this Lindbergh kidnapping discussion tomorrow? It's on Wednesday. Was it on Wednesday? Yes. It's free at noon, right? It is. I might check that out. You should. Jenny, is that covered pretty well? Yes. And how do they get in touch with you? Um, you can reach me directly on my phone number, which is 651-292-3237 or I'm listed on the staff directory uh, on our website, landmarkcenter.org. And I do actually have a volunteer with me that has volunteer packets. Great, um, oh, fantastic. So I have, and I have my business card with me as well. Well, you came prepared, thanks. I did. Kayla Betcher, Kayla, uh, Science Museum, a lot of perks for the volunteers. Yeah, so I'm from the Science Museum. My name's Kayla Betcher. I'm Get a little closer uh, to the mic, there you go. I'm the volunteer coordinator at the Science Museum. Um, I'm a small uh, two-person department, so it's me and my boss. Uh, it's pretty fun. We look for volunteers year-round. Um, we Our busiest season started back uh, at the very beginning of March with uh, field trips, uh, and it will go all the way through Labor Day. So this is a season where we really could use extra hands, but we do recruit volunteers all year round. We have a bunch of different positions, including event volunteers, where you pretty much fit events into your schedule and you only work six uh, events over the entire year. But we also have weekly, bi-weekly, uh, and summer program volunteering. We also do behind the scenes and group volunteer programs as well. So it's kind of, you can get hands on with visitors, but you can also step back and work behind the scenes to help us prepare supplies. Uh, and those, uh, a lot of those, um, Positions range from knowing, you know, Mississippi River biology, ecology, to physics, chemistry. Uh, we do paleontology. We can we have volunteers downstairs in our labs working with the scientists that we hire, uh, as well as doing visitor services in the lobby with us. So there's a lot of range uh, at the museum. A lot of you know that the museum that we're in now, we've only been there for about 25 years. Uh, we've always been in the downtown area, but moved several blocks. Uh, and that move was quite big. The building we're in now was built for the museum. Uh, the old building a few blocks away uh, became too small for all of us. So it's been pretty fun uh, being there. The museum's been open for about 111 years in its four locations. So we have had a very good group, but a very base group of volunteers. 
Uh, and a lot of our volunteers have been with us for the past uh, two to three buildings. Uh, so it's, it's been pretty fun. Um, being a volunteer at the museum, you're doing facilitating activities, so you're hands-on with the visitors. You're facilitating either uh, an activity which could be uh, making cardboard dinosaurs to, to doing a banana piano, all the way to looking at how, how many pennies you can put in a tinfoil uh, boat to see when it'll sink, uh, and collecting, uh, doing collector's corner with our visitors. So it's a really fun place to, to really get hands on and, and talk with community members and people from all over the world. Uh, the perks at the museum are pretty awesome. When you volunteer, you get 30 comp tickets for friends and family, but you always get in for free regardless because you'll get a badge, and that gets you Omni Theater and exhibits for free. So uh, the 30 tickets are for other people. You'll always get in for free, along with we have enrichment programs, potlucks, um, and then we have uh, a bunch of museum initiatives as well that volunteers can take uh, part of, including like one museum, one book, uh, where we talk about a lot of current issues and political issues that are a safe space for people who want to voice an opinion while also trying to learn about, uh, you know, the changing uh, political economy, so. So take a walk down to the Science Museum and ask for you or go on the website or? Yeah, so you can email me directly at K-B-O-E-T-T-C-H-E-R, my last name, at smm.org, but you can find the application on the website if you go smm.org slash volunteer or email volunteer at smm.org. That'll go right to my boss and myself. Yeah. So you'll get an immediate response. This is both exciting. Faith Loggers Jamnick Festival of Nations. Now the festival is what, May uh, 3rd through the 6th, but the volunteers start setting it up a couple days early. Is that the idea? Yeah, or? we sure do. Go ahead. So May 3rd through the 6th, so the Festival of Nations is up there. Yep. But I wanted to talk to you a little bit also. Um, my name is Faith, and I'm with the International Institute of Minnesota. So we're the ones who actually sponsor the Festival of Nations. Um, the Institute has been in the Twin Cities for almost 100 years. We're celebrating our 100th year in about two years from now. And we've sponsored the festival. That's going to be in its 86th year. So um, as far as the agency itself, as far as the Institute, we have all kinds of things for a lot of people. Are, most of our clients and students are foreign born. They're new Americans. Um, so they could have come here as immigrants but they could have also come here as asylees or refugees. And we actually serve about 100 students or clients every single day. Um, so we have ESL programs, um, about four different levels. We have a refugee services area. Um, we have a two employment programs. I specifically work with a nursing assistant program that's been around for about 27 years. So we help getting nursing assistants into hospitals and assisted living facilities, group homes. And then we also have a hospitality class for women specifically, um, who might be new Americans, maybe their English level is a little bit lower. Um, and then we can help them get ready for college if that's what they plan for their career. If they want to keep on going in their medical career, maybe they've worked back home in the refugee camps as a nurse. Um, maybe they've done a lot of caregiving for family members, which isn't uncommon for a lot of people that are born in different countries. So they've already cared for families. They already know that skill. We just have to teach them how to use a vacuum cleaner. Um, and they have to be certified. So we help them through those classes. So we have about three classes at any given time going on for about 12 weeks. And then we help them um, get to the state certification. Um, and we also have a trafficking division. So that's for labor, labor and sex trafficking. And we partner with the police officers and to um, get partners into the community once we find them. I'm trying to think. Um, so this is much, much broader than just work in the festival. Absolutely. Okay, great. And so our, our volunteers could be working in those areas, especially also immigration and citizenship. That's probably where we serve the most people. Most of our volunteer opportunities at the Institute, which is located right across from the State Fair on Como and Snelling, um, are going to be day opportunities, Monday through Friday, because that's when our students and clients are there. But you could also be a refugee mentor, which is something for evenings and weekends. Um, you could come in and as a group, you could provide a potluck for our students that we serve every day. But then um, I'm going to talk now about the festival, and that's the one that I'm really here for you right now, because that's where I need 500 volunteers <laughs> by May 3rd. Okay. So I really need your help. All right. um, so you can go onto the website, festivalofnations.com, and you can do all kinds of things. You can be a greeter. You can help with serving some of the food. You can be giving information if you've been to the festival before. Um, 
you can, you know, there's different variety of, of things that you can do. So you go to the website, Festival of Nations. On the top, there will be tabs for Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And then you can just scroll down and see the different opportunities as far as what you might want to do and what particular time slot. There's usually a three to four hour time slot, and you can get in free for that. And then also, if you work Thursday and Friday during student hours during the daytime, you can get a free ticket because there's 20,000 high school students that come down. Wow. And you don't want to really, you can enjoy the festival, but <laughs> to, to some extent. Um, the students make a lot of noise, and sometimes just your access to the different programs is going to be difficult. But yeah. come on down. It's 50,000 people that come on down. Um, and we'd really like to have your help. We really appreciate the volunteers that we have. May 3rd through the 6th, but the setting up starts on May 1st, and so you can use No, now. Now? Yeah, no, no, volunteer, get on the All website right. now. All right. So, because I have to send you your tickets and get everything ready. Great. Yep. Karen Brennan from Mears Park and the Gardeners, and um, what, Friends of Mears Park, do they maintain the gardens? Is that the group that does it? Yes, or? we do. We're Friends of Mears Park, and thank you for letting me stand, Peg. <laughs> Um, I have been a, a volunteer for Friends of Mirrors Park for the last 14 years. I have been a gardener for 10 years. I've been the secretary. I've been the community outreach person where I do all the fundraising and try to get money for our budget so we can help the city parks of recreation. So with that, um, I would like to talk on four different topics if I can recall them all. Um, the first is when we began. Secondly, who we are and what we consist of. Thirdly, how we work with the City Parks and Recreation and how you can help volunteer for the park. We have three different types of positions. We have one paid one, just a stipend type thing. We need a, an editor. Our editor got sick last year. He's in poor health, Lyra England, and so therefore I, we are looking for um, um, an editor. Yeah, Mears Park Messenger. And um, you would be talking to John about that later when I finish my little topic. But anyway, as I look out at the audience, I think of opportunity and I think of possibility. I think of the opportunity to tell you all about Friends of Mears Park because I think it's a lot of things you don't even know about us. We don't just do planting flowers. Um, and then the the opportunity and the possibility. The possibility is that, hey, you're listening to me tonight and maybe a whole bunch of you will stop, get my business card, and decide to volunteer for Friends of Mirrors Park. So let's begin. Um, the organization began in 1994 with Kay Peterson. Kay Peterson uh, worked in the park way before then, but it got officially started at that time, and John Manillo became part of that organization at that time. Um, Kay was a master gardener. She was a great person. She was an associate of mine, and she was a neighbor of mine at the Erie Condominiums. She passed away at 99 and a half years old. She didn't quite make it to 100. Um, we went to her celebration, and it was about two years ago. Mears Park, or Friends of Mears Park, donated a tree in her memory, and it is now, it is planted um, on 5th and Wabasha, up there on the knoll. You can't miss it, so do stop and see it. So, um, what is Mears Park, or Friends of Mears Park? Who do we, con what, what do we consist of? Well, we consist of a chair, John Manillo, uh, myself, I'm the secretary and fundraiser. We have two co-coordinators. Larry Wick is one of the co-coordinators. He's sitting up there with his wife, Judy, and he as well as a gardener. And Carol Konoma is the other co-coordinator. And um, Larry is the one that takes care of all the signage. If you become a gardener, signage and keys for the toolbox, keys for the spigot, things like that. Um, Carol is the person that assigns and reassigns gardens and takes care of all of the problems in the park. So we are a non-for-profit organization. We have our bylaws, we have our guidelines. We work with the city parks and recreation very, very closely. We have our annual meetings with the city parks and recreation. In fact, we're gonna have one May 1st at the Erie Condominiums. Pat, you might wanna join us. And um, we discuss homelessness, we discuss dogs, we discuss trees, 
we discuss repairs that we need to have done. And about dogs, dogs are really great puppies. But you know we have a few misbehaved, but they're not the misbehaved puppies, it's the misbehaved owners. And I know that last year we were talking with the city, which will come up again this year, or this spring, um, they had put new signage in, dog signage, and they cemented them in. Well, guess what happened? Whoever does this went and unscrewed the top, so there th the post is hanging out, but there's no signage for where the dogs can be. <laughs> so we have a lot of things that we do at the park, um, the city, and not only do, do we do that, within our budget two years ago, we helped repair the stream, and John, I think that was, what, about $28,000? Matched by the city. Matched by the city. Um, we had to put new white birch resonance trees by the stream, we paid for half of that. We've paid for um, teak benches, and you see all the beautiful hanging baskets around the perimeter of the park. We pay for those as well, and the maintenance of. So the sponsors are the ones that are doing such a good job for us, and that we're able to do something for the park. So we don't just do the park flowers. We take care of it. We help try to repair it. Mears Park needs to be fixed just like a house, and so we continue to do as much as we can. Yes. Now, volunteering. We need volunteers for gardens. Uh, Larry had said we had about 50 gardens, and I think we have, well, he said 100, but maybe not quite that many volunteers. But I do know there's availability for gardens, so um, please call Carol Canona on my um, card and um, she will assign, reassign gardens if you decide to come to be a gardener. We also need picker-uppers. Picker-uppers are people that help clean up the trash in the gardens. We dearly need that. We've had a lot of complaints about the, the, the park is not being picked up like it should be. And then thirdly, I wouldn't mind, if anybody wants to sponsor Friends of Muir's Park that's not familiar with what we do, I would love to hear from you and or any kind of fundraising projects that you might think would help me would be greatly appreciated. Right. And then, of course, the editor. So at ending, Friends of Muir's Park is a steward of Muir's Park. It is the emerald of downtown. It is the heartbeat of downtown. We keep the, the park beautiful because we have visitors coming down there, people, the residents around the area, the Cosmopolitan all live there, people come for weddings, people come for memories. So just remember about Muir's Park, it needs to be taken care of and loved. Remember, it's the heartbeat of Lower Town. And remember too, that where litter lies, beauty dies. Thank you. Thanks, Karen. <laughs> Kathleen Conger and Marshall Pritt, Latimer Library, who's gonna start? I saw like 15 volunteer opportunities on the website and inside and outside. Uh, there are many volunteer opportunities at the St. Paul Libraries as a whole. Uh, we are here to talk specifically about the George Latimer Central Library, which is the beautiful 100 year old building built in the style of Italian Renaissance revival. In September 2015 through January 2016, we underwent a fairly major renovation, and our innovation lab was born out of that. So the Latimer Library provides the traditional library services. We do have books, but so much more. We also have computers, we have much programming, and we have our very exciting innovation lab, which Marshall will be talking about. Uh, also, we provide services for the community, such as CROP that I talked about during the question and answer session with the police. So when you think of the library, think on beyond books. Now, for volunteer opportunities, we do have Adopt-A-Shelf, traditional library service, where you can help maintain the collection keep shelves straight, uh, look for items that need repair. We also need uh, volunteers for special events, and we have a very special event coming up. We will be a gallery site for the St. Paul Art Crawl. And so 
we need you to come and visit us because in downtown we are a geographical outlier. Most of the galleries are in Lower Town. Come over to the beautiful George Latimer Central Library, see the art and the special events we have planned. I also look for greeters for that event and, um, and people to help at other special events and concerts that we hold at the library. Now Marshall will tell about the Innovation Lab and the opportunities there. Grab a mic there, Marshall. Thanks, Kathleen. Uh, so Kathleen kind of touched on it. Um, in 2016, when the library reopened, um, one of the main features of the renovation was uh, the third floor of the Nicholson Workforce and Innovation Center. So um, that's, that included um, a lot of brand new public internet computers, but also um, a classroom and an innovation lab. So the innovation lab is um, it's an adult maker space, so 18 plus. And what that means is it's kind of, you know, it's, it's, it's a maker space, right? Like you make things there. So we have um, a laser engraver, so you can engrave um, woods, plastics, glass. Um, we have a vinyl cutter, so you can um, make stickers. We have two 3D printers. If you've ever been interested in that, come check it out at the library. Um, We've got digitization equipment, so if you have um, old VHSs or cassette tapes or records, you can bring them to the library and have them turned into digital files that you can keep forever uh, that will never degrade. We have an audio recording studio, so you can record um, you know, yourself talking, you can make a podcast, you can make music. Um, we have a soundproof recording studio. We have a couple of study rooms that are soundproof as well. Um, and five sewing machines, is it five? Six, yeah. Six, we just received another donation. We also have a serger, if you're familiar with what that is. Um, we have a lot of yarn, we have knitting supplies. Um, so really, any kind of making activity um, could happen at the library. And we have um, volunteers who volunteer sort of across the spectrum of those things. So we had um, a very dedicated volunteer who ran a 3D printing class. She actually is uh, on uh, maternal leave now. <laughs> from the library, um, so congratulations to her, but we need someone to teach a 3D printing class now. Um, so pretty much, um, you know, you don't have to be an expert on any piece of equipment or software when you show up. You can, you know, you can come in, you can become a member of the lab, which is free to do, and just sort of learn it. Um, the library staff or other volunteers are there to assist you. And then once you feel comfortable, um, you know, ideally the volunteer would then begin assisting patients, patrons themselves or um, offering classes on it if you feel that you've reached a certain level of skill. Um, anything, anything, anything else with Innovation Lab though? Um, we would love, you know, we're, we're really open to like anything, anything that you would call making. Um, we'd love to support you at the library. If I brought over my tablet, could you install my ESPN app? <laughs> that would actually be better suited, that's a great segue. Um, that, that, yeah. That would be better suited for um, our Open Lab, which is a service that we offer um, currently four days a week, uh, three hours a day. That's currently staffed by myself. Um, and the Open Open Lab, it's an you open could do computer it. lab. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so it's it's basically like walk-in tech support, pretty That's much. Great. So um, you know, you could come in and you know make an email account, make a resume. Um, <laughs> you know, install an app on your this iPad. Is great. This um, is great. It's, what are the hours again? So that's 10 to 1. 10 Tuesday, to 1. Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, okay. And 1 to 4 on Mondays. And I can ask for you? You can, yeah. All right. Um, so I always look for the youngest person in the room to do my tech <laughs> stuff, so. I don't know if you're like that, but. I... Yeah, so, um, so that's, we would love volunteers for that also. All right. That's, um, that's sort of, you know, if you feel kind of intimidated by the Innovation Lab and all it has to offer, it's sort of, you know, higher tech, maybe more of a specialist thing. Um, Open Lab is very general. If you've got skills with Microsoft Word, PowerPoint, um, just email accounts, just Googling even is like a valuable skill um, for volunteers in Open Lab. Um, it's, it's a great service. You could help people, you know, it really spans the spectrum. I've helped people find jobs, yeah. um, housing, sign up for health insurance. Um, you know, I've, I've helped a guy start a blog. I've helped people um, make logos for their business. You know, there's all kinds of, it's a really broad spectrum of stuff you can do in Open Lab. You've sold us, Marshall, it's great. <laughs> Thanks. No, just go to the website or what, how do you wanna? Uh, 
we have volunteer applications with us today, so you can pick up an application, Great. you could get a business card from Marshall or from me, and you can go to sppl.org. Fantastic. I like this last one because it's the private sector getting involved, and this is Spire Credit Union in the Cray Plaza, and Jim Ganger is here. Jim, this is the second year for the litter cleanup crew? It is the second year, so we're pretty excited about it. Last year we started, I'll give you some more information about how we do things and what we're all about, but before I start, I I've been in Lower Town for 10 years this um, November. I, I never knew this existed. This has been awesome tonight. You guys rock, I'm serious, this is great. Congratulations, I'm not kidding. I'm just, I, I will be here as a visitor next time, I promise. Great. All right, um, yes, Spire Credit Union. So uh, we are in Clay, uh, Cray Plaza. We have a location, moved there about three years ago, two, two years ago now. And uh, I live down here, obviously. So walking back and forth, I'm like, gosh, there's gotta be something we can do to help um, with the park. The park and, and the area around the park, all around Lower Town is just filthy. Um, and I started thinking about how do we do this? So we uh, born the, uh, or birthed, I should say, the uh, Lower Town Cleanup Crew. And so last year we had six days that we asked people to, and all we did was get on the Lower Town website and say, listen, we're thinking about doing this. If you're interested, show up this day. And so that's how it all started. One of the things that Spire Credit Union is all about with our um, employees is we try to have everyone give back at least 10 hours a year is what we suggest to them. And so this was just a nice way for people to come down, some of our employees. Well, then all of a sudden we got some residents that were showing up, which was great. Uh, had a couple homeless individuals that offered to help out and they just wanted to get the cookies afterwards, which was great. Uh, I'm not kidding, it worked out wonderful. Um, and so it just started expanding. So I think our biggest last year, we had 14 people at one time. Uh, cleaned up. We spend two hours on a Sunday from one until three. Now I know I cannot give, you can't compete with passes to, uh, uh, to the uh, Science Museum, but. You got the black dog involved, don't you? What's that? Yes, yes we do. Sarah from the black dog is offering up beer. All right, so we get free beer, one free beer after you're done at three o'clock, so that's great. So, so I can't compete, and get this, you get a t-shirt. So we're also giving away t-shirts, which is great for everyone that shows up. Um, it's just, it's really fun. It's family friendly for the most part. I will tell you, it, well. <laughs> Depends on, on what you find, I suppose. Well, it, exactly. What yeah. you find around Lower Town, let's just be honest. Um, we try to keep the families in the park and others try to go into some of the, the seedier places around and, and uh, mm -hmm. uh, just different areas we try to keep to the older folks. And, and you start May 6th, I think it's once a month, isn't it? it? It's about once a month, yep. We start May 6th. By the way, May 6th, we need some help right now. We have eight people signed up, so if you guys are interested, um, we have these little flyers, which are cool, so okay. I can hand out. Yep. We have our own little website portal, so all you have to do is go onto our website, click on it, you can sign up there, we'll push out all the information to you. Did I mention beer at three o'clock every Sunday that we have an event. Free beer. Free beer. Yeah, One free beer. Thank all right. you very much all, for having us. All right. Now, uh, they'll, they, as on their way out, you can tackle them, your favorite, and, and get more information. And, and I think there's a lot of great opportunities here and an embarrassment of riches. So uh, let's give our volunteer coordinators a big hand. Yeah, well, thanks a lot. Now, um, Dan Nijelic, Nijelic, is that right? Nijelic. Nijelic, all right. Now, Hanley told me this is about downtown infrastructure. But he also said you're such a good storyteller that it is not as boring as it sounds. I sure hope not. Go ahead. Thank you. My name's Dan Nishalik with the Department of Safety and Inspections, and Bill gave me three tasks tonight. One, I'm supposed to provide you useful information. Two is, I have three minutes to do it. <laughs> and the third is, I have to make it fun. Now, anybody who knows who the Department of Safety and Inspection is, we are the regulators for the city of St. Paul. Fun and regulation usually don't go hand in hand. But I appreciate the offer tonight because really, uh, myself and, my, and our team really have a lot of fun because we work with people like yourselves that make this a great place for anybody who lives here, works here, plays here, wants to learn, wants to shop, wants to visit. Because it is a lot of fun. We do have a lot of fun. I will see if I can make this somewhat fun, uh, but we do like working with yourself. So real quick, first of all, useful information number one. If you ever need your first call to City Hall, you don't know who do I call or what was that number, 651-266-8989. Uh, we have a staff, you will actually talk to a live person. You don't have to go, do 
do one, do six, do seven, do one. You will talk to a live person, they will help you connect who you're looking to. If you know who you need to talk to and you have their number, go ahead. But if you ever have a question, this is your one call to City Hall for information, complaints. We handled over 80,000 calls last year, took in 30,000 complaints. Wow. And one thing we're also measuring is you can also send a compliment. And we receive a lot of those. We're going to start measuring those too. So information, complaints, compliment, 651-266-8989. We're looking to grow it so we have even more services, but we really want to be a real strong source of information for yourselves or a way to get compliments and complaints to the city of St. Paul. Second useful information, for those of you who use the Skyway, we now have a web app. So one of the things we've heard is people get lost in the Skyway. Mm -hmm. So working with our Office of Technology, we have created a web, lab, web app. Um, go to stpaul.gov backslash Skyway. You can click on this and you can then get a handy dandy app on your phone. You click on where you are, it will tell you Skyway hours, what's around and things like that. So another hopefully peaceful information for yourselves. Moving right along, um, one of the questions that's come up in the Skyways is we have some public urination issues. I was happy to find out that we are not alone in the world about having public urination problems. The city of Paris, uh, a wonderful city, um, is addressing there is using these public urinals, which then are used in the bottom is a bale of straw um, that it uses for flowers then. But no, we're not looking at this. Uh, but we are doing a survey of restrooms in the public Skyway system to make sure there are public restrooms for customers as well as visitors. But Great. I'm happy to report we share something with Paris. So <laughs> moving right along, um, we also work with short-term rentals, people who want to rent their house for short term. We've gotten past the Super Bowl craze. Sure, rent your home for $10,000 per day. Yes, we saw those signs around the city. We are currently in the process of anybody who is operating a short-term rental, if that's you, um, you do need a license in the city of St. Paul to operate a short-term rental. We have a really simple process for doing it, but we want to make sure for the bad actors, we have a hook to take them out of business. But for the good actors, we're doing a lot of education with people. A lot of these are new business operators. They don't realize they're a business operator. We want to make sure they have like proper insurance to protect protect them and their guests, but also know how to operate a business. Moving along, the Department of Safety and Inspections, through the um, wonderful um, um, gift of the council and the mayor, we have a $1 million um, technology um, budget this year. Yeah. We're doing a number of things. Has anybody ever used St. Paul Connect or C Click Fix? No? There's a good, that's actually a good thing. We've had some problems with it, so we're going to completely redo it. So I'm glad nobody used it because I hear all the problems. We are actually going to shut down um, our St. Paul Connect, and we're actually going to come up with a good app. And what C Click Fix or St. Paul Connect is you're going along, you see a problem, you see a graffiti, take a picture, and you send to us via your phone. The problem is when we initially um, op um, introduced it five years ago. It was not integrated into our system, so you never got a response back whether it ever got resolved or not. This summer, we are going to take it down, bring it back. You'll actually be able to give us a complaint based on a photo and click on the button, and when it's resolved, which it will be, you will get notice that it's been resolved. In addition to that, uh, for our business customers, as well as anybody who has a alarm permit or that with us, so or dog licenses, um, we will have a brand new portal, which will be basically your portal to the city of St. Paul to do business with us. So if you want to get a license, um, you need a dog license, alarm permit, things like that, we're going to roll out a brand new portal. This is what they have in New York City. Ours, of course, will be better. Um, but it will be you come in, you can do all kind of business with us, one portal, one door to the city of St. Paul. We'll roll it out this year for business licensing and continue to grow it as a city such that any business in the future that you do with the city of St. Paul would be going through this portal. But this year we're rolling out for business licensing, alarm permits, animal licenses, and things like that. And rolling right along, another part of our technology improvements, electronic plan review. So let's say you want to build a building in the city of St. Paul. You usually have to bring in this tree. 
And they're usually about this round and about that tall. They're major plants. And so basically all our staff have to read through the plants. Well, we're going to get rid of all the trees, and they'll be able to uh, submit them electronically. So we're saving trees. Um, a better thing for the environment, more importantly, we'll be able to more efficiently do business in the city of St. Paul. So those are all parts of our $1 million technology investment this year at the Department of Safety Inspection. So you're going to see much improved services. And finally, the final note of the night is there is a lot of great things happening in the city of St. Paul. Uh, a lot of investment, but um, as you can see here, this shows um, the total valuation of construction permits occurring in the city of St. Paul. Wow. And in 2017, we hit a record, the most uh, construction activity we've seen in the city of St. Paul. It is a great time to be in the city of St. Paul. A lot of great things going on. We want to work with you, have fun doing it, because it's a whole lot more fun doing regulation when you're having fun and working with yourselves. So thank you for the opportunity, and have a great evening. Dan Angelic, the answer man. Bill Hanley, take us home. Thank you, Dan. You did make that entertaining, and it actually moved along, so thank you very much. Um, and thank everybody for coming. This was terrific. Um, uh, it's just been a great thing. Thank you very much for uh, Peg Guilfoyle and John Manila, who helped put this together. And of course, thanks to Eric Escala, who brought it all together. Thank you. Thank you.